So how many of you are from the Midwest? A, a few of us, originally. Well, if you're from the Midwest or you travel through it, you know that you are traveling through a, a sea of corn and soybeans. Um, and that, that's true in, the, in much of the Great Plains, too. It's a highly specialized system, and uh, it really dominates the landscape on as much as 50% of the U.S. Prime, prime farmland, not only in the Midwest, but throughout the country. So it's large. Um, the corn soybean system relies on multinational corporate controlled technology such as seeds, fertilizer, pesticides, and machinery. 50, as much as 50 or 75 percent of the land in some areas is rented. That's a factor in how the system works. This industrial system relies on public support for roads, the Mississippi River Transportation System, uh, publicly funded research on agricultural systems and federally subsidized uh, farm bill, commodity, crop insurance, and conservation program support, among other things. So there's a lot of investment in the system, uh, as well as individual farmer investments that are substantial that have been made on equipment. And it's also strongly in, uh, dependent on extensive markets um, that include exports, processed foods, as we've heard, fuel and feed for uh, large-scale confined animal feeding operations, and of course all of these are subjects of parallel sessions that are going on this afternoon or tomorrow. And farmers have been strongly guided to adopt the system ba uh, based on uh, these drivers. And at the same time as we know there are unintended externalized costs that result from the way the entire system scales from individual farms up to a landscape level or community level. and. Um, despite the fact that farmers are, are adopting conservation practices. So there's a range of environmental, social, public health, and equity externalities, as we're also aware of in this conference, that could be considered. And this session is, is focusing particularly on the ecological and conservation-related uh, impacts and issues. We're in hoping to identify the monetary costs as we go through and also talk about the structural changes that uh, could lead to transition. So we hope to have that kind of conversation. So now I'm, gonna, I'm really pleased to introduce our panelists. Uh, Dr. Eugene Turner is Boyd Professor in Oceanography and Coastal Sciences at Louisiana State University, and he conducts research on wetlands, ecosystem sustainability, and we'll hear more about dead zones. And uh, he's active in Greenland's Blue Waters, which promotes farming, uh, sustainable farming through perennial grasses. And Dr. Rick Cruz is a professor in agronomy at Iowa State University. He's a fellow of the American Society of Agronomy and Soil Science Society of America. And he received the President's Leadership Award in soil, from the Soil and Water Conservation Society. And his research is soil erosion and water related issues. Dr. Matt O'Neill, Matthew O'Neill, is Associate Professor of Entomology at Iowa State University, where he focuses on economically sustainable insect pest management programs for soybeans and explores multiple approaches uh, to prevent uh, pest outbreaks and conserve beneficial in insects, and is chair of the graduate program in sustainability at Iowa State. And Mr. Craig Cox leads the environmental working groups, research and advocacy work in agriculture, renewable energy, climate change, and directs uh, the Midwest office. He has degrees in wildlife ecology and agricultural economics. He's worked for Minnesota DNR, and uh, the National Academy of Sciences, the U.S. Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry, and uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and is a formerly the executive director of the Soil and Water Conservation Society. And several of these folks are avid hunters and birders and fishers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm also pleased to introduce our respondent, Mr. Jim Erdahl. Jim is uh, who, with his wife, farms. Uh, 1,400 acres of corn and soybeans, uh, is a fourth generation farmer. He has an associate degree of, uh, of science degree that he got in 1980, and he began his farming career working with his father. And in his quest for the definition of sustainability, he draws upon his passion for the exchange of new ideas and his belief that being a farmer is a privilege, not a right. So um, that's my timer. Uh, I'm almost done. <laughs> That bad example. So the panel members will each speak for 12 minutes <laughs> with a timer, and we'll be followed by a response from, from Jim, and then we'll engage in a discussion with you and invite your comments and questions. So I'm just going to go right through the panel, and then we'll open it up to questions. So we'll start with Gene. All right. Thanks. So you're going to 
So uh, use the ABT method, which is I'll start with some and, 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 this is the way it is, and then I'll, the next talks will go into what we might do or we are doing about it. Uh, up in Louisiana, and I'm at the tip of the river at the end of the pipe, and we're receiving the nutrients from the land coming off from the watershed as a whole. So the, just to, the watershed we have, this will be a fairly quick summary, is that it's a huge funnel, it's coming down at the bottom, and there's this red zone at the bottom, which is basically uh, devoid of oxygen, or much oxygen in the end of the summer. It's about the size of Lake Erie, if you look it up here. And it's in a watershed that's basically about 58% intensively farmed in some way, and then another 18% of uh, rangeland or pasture land, or uh, maybe barren. So we've got this large funnel coming down. It's all being focused at one point. And the main thing that's driving this formation of the red area down there is that the nitrogen load is coming off the land. So it's been formed over 200 years. This is not a casual development that's this uh, oxygen zone at the bottom. It's not a natural area. It's because of the economic and political history of the landscape, and I'll describe that just a little bit. So the size of the oxygen zone on the bottom is about the size of Massachusetts at the point now. It starts sometimes early as February, but dissipates. But it's pretty steady from uh, May through you know, September in case of a storm. So that's the, the red area here. It reaches basically into Texas, and it's not too far offshore. It's in shallow water, which means it goes from about five meters, uh, three, three meters sometimes, uh, out to about 100 meters, so which is on the shelf. So it's covering most of the shelf at this point and, ha and has not always been there. Uh, and... It's not the only one in the world. We've had about now, if we're doing a count, probably 450, 500 uh, low oxygen zones on the that are formed by anthropogenic processes across the world, and they've all come up in places that are intensively the watershed is intensively changed in some way. And uh, with the most notable, the largest one in, is in the Baltic. But the second largest one, the largest one in the Atlantic, is the one we have off the Gulf of Mexico at the end of the Mississippi River. Uh, it's called the dead zone, which is the layperson's term. Uh, the, the newspaper people, it's not very sexy. Uh, we have a low budget. You can see we've got lint flannel shirts for divers. And, <laughs> uh, we've got on the bottom a layer of material that's come down to the bottom, and it's sulfitic underneath, mostly. So the organisms cannot live up, live there, and if they can't get away, they will uh, be moribund or sometimes they'll die. Uh, it's called a dead zone because for fishermen, uh, they can't find the organisms that they're after because they're motile and they'll leave ahead of it. They'll leave in the front. So sometimes you'll find them concentrated on the edge of this low oxygen zone. It's hard to predict where it's going to be exactly on that, so there's a lot more cost for the fishermen for their you know, 30 or 40 percent of their costs, their gross costs, are gasoline. So they're having, and they have no insurance. They may not have a lot of things they used to have on the boat, but they have to have gasoline, and that's a lot large part of the cost. Uh, you will find sometimes uh, starfish on the bottom, you know, up on their legs doing push-ups because they're trying to get out of the no oxygen zone just beneath of it. And the only fish we'll find in there sometimes for croaker are the males. The females tend to leave before the males do. So there's something going on there, physiologically. <laughs> but you find compromises to their uh, reproductive organs, organs and the, when they do stay in there. And there is migration barrier for the shrimp to go from the offshore where they're spawned to the inshore where they grow up and back out again. So they can't go north and south as easily because they have uh, their bottom feeding organs. Uh, this is just some of the organisms on it, and uh, the food organisms are down there as well. So they're no longer in the sediment. So the organisms that are swimming by that like to dip down into it uh, won't have the food as, as well. So there's a consequence in the fisheries, and sometimes they get trapped and you have large fish, fish kills 
near the uh, barrier islands. So the reason it forms is because the nutrients coming down from the Mississippi River are a nutrient source and they fertilize the surface waters. So the al algae grow. So I'll have a little more detail on that, but basically the, the zooplankton are eating them and they're forming a, a package of feces in the excretory product. So it's, it's not just one algae, but a lot of them. And they're surrounded by a mucilage outer coating and they sink like a prover proverbial rock to the bottom. So they're not respiring on the way down. They're, they're going down quickly and they respire on the bottom. And that's what the ox oxygen consumption is, process is. Uh, microbes decompose them on the bottom. Uh, and then the layer on the bottom is formed by the stratification of the water from the river on the top. It's cold, it's warmer and uh, it's fresher. And it's not as dense as the material on the bottom, which is seawater coming up on the bottom. So the winds can blow up here and the water below has to go out or the winds go that way and the water has to come up. And that determines kind of the day-to-day -day, uh, position of the low oxygen zone, which might be only this thick or it might be as tall as this room. Depends where you are. So that's kind of, that's how it, how it becomes hypoxic, which is defined by being two milligrams per liter and it's, you know, 20% saturation or less. And sometimes it goes completely without oxygen. So uh, we, we know that this area is basically nitrogen limited. The nitrogen, uh, we know that because of, we've done uh, paleontological studies of the sediments to look to see what's in them and why. And we know from modeling them, which I do every year, to predict the size of the zone three months later because it takes a while to incubate the system. That nitrogen, if you know the nitrogen loading in May from the river, you know what's going to happen in July. And this is just one example of that. And it's a pretty good fit, but it, it changes a lot through the year. So we're pretty sure it's not phosphorus, although occasionally it is uh, partially uh, driving this fertilizing effect. But it's mostly nitrogen load. And the load has increased uh, a little bit from uh, when Europeans entered the landscape from 200 years ago. And they cleared it, and all this kind of capitalized, stormed, um, excuse me, capitalized, uh, stored nitrogen in the soil and the trees that was all stirred up from the Europeans moving in and cutting it down, basically, uh, and plowing it up for the first time. So there's a big release of nutrients then. And then there was a little bit, uh, another pulse of nutrients that came in when we drained wetlands. But there was a huge pulse. We started to intensively farm this with fertilizers at the end of World War II in the 60s. And that's what's driving this because it's now crossed the threshold. And the other thing about this is that uh, the graph here, I promise you not too many more, it's just uh, if you look at the size of the zone for the amount of nitrogen coming down, which is shown on the vertical, it's, it's driving more hypoxia for the same amount of nitrogen every year. So it has started around 19, late 1970s to form the hypoxic zone, and the size of the zone is increasing for the same amount of nitrogen coming down. So we have fluctuations in the nitrate coming down every year, but every year it's a little more impact because of it. And part of that's because of climate change, and part of that's because the organic material from the previous years is stored in the bottom and they're respiring the next year and the next year and the next year. So there's an additive cumulative effect from this. And uh, another uh, thing about this is that we also come, comes down with silica in it and you need the silica for the diatoms which form the food web for the fisheries which is a diatom, a type of algae and then the zooplankton, and then the zooplankton are fed upon by the desirable fish. If you don't have the silica, if you don't have the silica, then you, in the right ratio with nitrogen, then you get an alternative food chain. And what you get is one that has no zooplankton, or very few of them, and you get flagellated algae, and then they are forming what we call harmful algal blooms, which in this case, that white circle is around a very big ship. And that red area is a big algae bloom that's formed after it in the Baltic. And uh, we don't always know which bloom is going to form because they're like teenagers, and you know, you know, you can't quite predict what teenagers are going to do. 
and uh, some of the consequences of this is that um, you have memory loss. <laughs> <laughs> and so like one of the con so the, the drivers of this is that it's the land use in the watershed. And I'll just give you one and one of the factors for that, and I'll just give an example, is that if you, and this is from a data from Iowa, if you know the percent of cropland in the area and you know then you know basically the nitrate runoff. It's a very direct relationship for it varies with soil type. It uh, varies with a few other things, but this is from uh, Bill Crumpton's stuff in uh, Iowa. So it's pretty much a land-driven operation, and that land that choices for land is driven or had been driven by uh, subsidies from the farm bill. Which, if you draw a straight line with uh, land subsidies, you get a nice relationship with all kinds of things, including nitrate coming off it. So most of the nitrate coming off it is from farmland. One minute is from farmland. You can see the density of red on here. It's all coming. Phosphorus and nitrogen is coming off from where we have the corn, so corn soybean land system. And it's not only a question of uh, stewardship and effects for the end of the pipe, it's also in the uh, stream lengths or out through the whole country, about a third of the streams in the U.S. are compromised in some way by nitrogen and phosphorus pollutants. And there's a very variety of other ones. So we have options. <laughs> And uh, one of them is to ignore it. And this has been developing for 200 years, and it's going to take decades to back out of it and to have an alternative choices being made on it. Now, we'd be glad to cover other points later. All right. Thank you. Thanks. So who's next? Kevin Rick? Okay, uh, but, 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 but. Well, that's obviously not the right way to go. That doesn't work, too. Get out of that. That's nice. Click that bar right there. We're technology starved. You thought memory loss. There we go. There we go. <laughs> you know, perspective is, is a great thing. You know, the same person can look at a given item and get a totally different perspective than if they look at the same item from a different direction, orientation. Okay, perspective is the same way with uh, the soil erosion. When we address what does it cost, there are different perspectives, and different perspectives may give you different answers. For example, what, uh, what's the cost of new phase? We have on-site costs. We have off-site costs. And then we have something that people hardly ever talk about, and that's the future, global food security. Uh, this one we know who's going to pay, but to put it out of is going to be really tough. So to address the, the first thing in terms of what impact it has on site, we're trying to do an estimate of what does erosion cost as it affects crop production. And to do that, there's a couple things that uh, we need to know. First is what is the relationship between soil loss and crop yield? I mean, you, you got to know that. To do that, we pull from the literature a couple of statements. One is yield reductions of approximately 4% for per four inches of soil should be considered realistic. Okay, remember that 4%, please. And, and, and the other one is this. For nutrient deficits are avoided by fertilization, response curves are generally convex, and blight reductions will become increasingly severe with further erosion. Now, if that's not academically intense, nothing is. <laughs> it's vaguely specific, and it's meant to be that way. So a picture is much better than those words. Now, this is a, a picture showing core yield change. These are measured information versus the depth of the horizon. That's that that topsoil that we always talk about. 
What happens to yield of corn as the topsoil is? Yield goes down. What is the rate of yield loss as we get the thinner topsoil? It decreases faster. Okay, that's corn. Here's soybeans. Okay, now do all soils respond the same? Absolutely not. If this is tip, a typical example of what we would see. We need to know this relationship to determine the effect of lost topsoil on crop yield. So the question is, how much soil are we actually losing? Okay, this is data of the grass from a project we just released this past year, in which we're estimating soil erosion daily across the state of Iowa, and Iowa is going to be our test bed. For each one of these 12 watersheds, we give a daily estimate to get this pictorial or this slide. We've added the daily estimates or the da daily estimates for each watershed through the year and color coded them. Color codes range from zero to one tons per acre up to greater than 50. The number in the middle of each of these identify the statewide average across that whole area. You can see there is spatial differences. Uh, some of these areas here greater than 50 tons in that given year. The years vary because of Rain. rainfall, Bingo. 2012, incredibly dry and hot. Not much happening. So if we look at 2007 through 2014, okay, we're going to try to determine the effect of loss on yield ac across the entire state through that time period. We lost an average of 5.7 tons per acre per year. This is a sidelight. We are losing one pound of soil for every pound of corn grain that we produce. Do the math. That's what it is. The depth of this is, a, is about a dime or a little less, actually. So now the complex issue is this. Uh, this is a picture of the landscape in north central Iowa. Why the light color? What does light color signify? Low, low organic matter, low fertility. It's where this topsoil has been eroded and is gone. How about the dark areas? It's where it's accumulated. Okay, so when we try to make these estimates, we have to understand that across the landscape, the depth of this topsoil is variable. Okay, and then if we look at this curve, so we're trying to come up with a cost number for you. Depending upon where you make your measurement, your estimate, in terms of topsoil depth, you get different answers. So it's pretty complex, it's multidimensional. So we're going to simplify, 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 use averages. And if we do that across some work that we recently have done, have not published it yet, we're getting an average of about 2.2 bushels per acre yield reduction per inch of topsoil loss. If we use 170 70 bushel per acre as our average, which we've had across the state since 2006 through 2015, our loss reduction per four inches is 5%. What was that first number I asked you to remember? 4%. Four. Four percent. Okay, this is not published, it's not been peer reviewed, so we compare it against that that has been, we're in the ballpark. So I feel a little bit comfortable giving you some numbers with this. Okay, so if we assume corn is four dollars per bushel, five point seven tons per acre per year, the next year the farmer will suffer a, a, a economic loss of thirty-five cents per acre. That's not very much. The rest of the story is this, though. You got to look at uh, well, a little more about the nutrient loss. Each ton of soil, again, big differences, big averages, but about two pounds of N and one pound of phosphorus. If you assume that uh, about 35% of that soil leaves the, leaves the field with those nutrient values, each year we're losing about $4.20 worth of nutrients. Per ton or per per, per acre, per acre. We're losing actually about two tons of that 5.7 to leave the field. Other parts of it are deposited within field. So that's not part of this estimate. Now when we put these two numbers together and then ask the question, cumulative, cum, cumulatively, it is coffee, it's not beer, through time, 
What does that look like? We get a curve. Okay, understand the first year's erosion has a yield impact in year two. Yield three, you have year one impact plus year two impact. Year four, you've got, you keep stacking additional erosion impacts from previous years. It's like compound interest. Okay, so now, 35 cents the first year, or the second year, by the time we get out of here 50 years, and I've used 50 years far more than longevity, by the end of 50 years, the cumulative effect through time is about $650 per acre. And I'm going to throw something else on here. Conservation on the industrial form of corn soybeans replies you add something to what you're doing, and there's a cost associated with it. Let's assume that the cost of conservation is $30 per acre, growing cover crops as an example. The cumulative cost is this linear line. Every year you add another $30. The cost associated with the conservation is much greater than the cost that would be associated if you just let solely road. That's not what we want to hear. It's not. Okay, let's remember some of those red blotchy areas on that map where we really had high erosion rates. If we look at 35 tons per acre per year, 38.5 tons per acre per year, we get different answers. Okay, notice that this axis has changed dramatically. By 50 years, now we're looking at a per acre loss cumulatively of over $4,500 over that 50 year period. Now if we throw that $30 per acre conservation line on there, the slope is different because we've changed this axis. axis. Almost immediately, we are making money very ahead. Offsite costs from a paper by a uh, published in the International Journal of Ag Sustainability, Offsite costs are about twelve to thirty-eight dollars per acre. That's their estimate. What does that mean? Remediation or that means things like dredging, mm -hmm. the water quality issues that uh, Gene talked about, natural resources, human health, and biodiversity is what it went into those estimates. There's another part, and that's that the the part of policy government programs. Between 2005 and 2014, about $3 billion was spent on conservation programs in Iowa. If you take that across the 24 million crop acres, that's $125 per acre, or about $12.50 per year spent on trying to conserve. Now, all that money isn't spent uniformly, it's concentrated, but it's money that goes into our current farm programs. So in summary, putting some numbers together, Farm costs of about $4.50 per acre, that 5.7 tons per acre we use. Offsite damage is of average 25. Public investment, put those together, over $40 per acre is the cost associated with our current industrial system. There's other things we can add to it, and uh, Craig can talk about that too. Global food security. I have no freaking idea how to put numbers on that, but I know this, and this is a quote from Seth Watkins that showed up in Successful Farming just recently. We have the farm program since the mid-1930s, and we do have to overproduce to feed the world, but we have to take care of this land. If we really have to feed 9 billion people by 2050, we're really going to need this soil, period. The conclusion part, am I right, am I right Seth? Okay, another point. What did you say the, the net profit likely across the state would be for corn production? Corn's going to make up 15 million, 45 dollars a day. Okay, that's the profit. How much are we investing? 40. About 40. And you can do the math in terms of ratios. Okay, so the summary that I put is, is our, our, our form of agriculture, soil conservation is more expensive than soil erosion for the farmer. Period except when you have high erosion rates, or if the farmer owns the land for a long period of time. The majority of our land is rented in Iowa, short-term rent, he cannot pay for conservation. Erosion cost of the public is greater than the cost of the farmer. Amen?
Oh, well, let me start by saying I wish I was drinking what he was drinking. <laughs> it's not really pretty good. Uh, I can promise you there will be no elephant butts in this little <laughs> set. So my name is Matt O'Neill. Uh, I'm an entomologist at Iowa State University, uh, originally from the Midwest, uh, from a small town just north of Hannibal, Missouri, home to... Oh, come on. Mark Twain? Mark Twain, Tom, author Tom Sawyer, left an impression on me. And uh, he once said, the previous speaker likes to talk, or the previous speaker talked until you were bored. I'm going to talk until I'm bored. <laughs> <laughs> so I was asked to talk about um, the consequences, and put dollar uh, on this, uh, to, um, of agriculture to both pests and beneficial insects, uh, and do this in 12 minutes. Um, and that's a little bit challenging. If there's time, I can throw some uh, numbers out with regard to pests, but um, I'm going to try to tell a story. And I'm going to go big picture and then small picture and focus in on one group of beneficial insects that has been very in the news recently and has some uh, interaction with the agricultural systems we've been talking about. Uh, and it's something that uh, gets me excited. So that's enough reason to talk. So the big picture is that uh, we are in a phase globally of we've transitioned from a landscape in, uh, that was dominated by natural systems to, the, in, in terms of what Foley et al. said in this 2005 science article, that's this pre-settlement period. We've now transitioned into what they define as an intensive period, where most of the terrestrial habitat is agriculture. And it's what they describe as intensive agriculture. And I'm going to argue uh, throughout this talk that intensive agriculture implies two things. It implies how the land is used, that is, it's been transfer, trans, uh, uh, transferred into from e natural ecosystems into ag, uh, and, in, and it also includes the inputs that go into that agriculture. So there's sort of two levels to this intensification. So that's globally, right? In Iowa, we can see that global change occurring. Um, from pre-settlement times, when the Europeans arrived, they saw this. This is uh, tall grass prairie, combination of multiple species of grass, perennial grasses and forbs, uh, there is some oak savanna, but at the time of settlement, 80% of Iowa was this. Now we're less than 1%, with small, small patches of remnant and some reconstruction. And we've talked about Iowa, um, but for those of you for whom this is flyover, um, this is Iowa. And now in this intensive phase of human's impact on the global terrestrial ecosystem. Uh, USDA shows us that, what, 86% of Iowa is classified as farmland. And of that, 85% is considered cropland. And the most comprehensive set of data out of the National Ag Statistics Service said that was about two, or I'm sorry, 10 million acres of soybeans and a little over 13 and a half million acres of corn. So a landscape that is intensively uh, farmed for these two annual crops in a landscape that used to be dominated by perennial vegetation, both grasses and forbs. And that change is, uh, I think, captured by the media and the public with the expression, a green desert. Green being very productive, very productive. We're one of the most productive places on the planet when it comes to those crops but it comes at a cost in the form of reduced biodiversity. And one form that that reduced biodiversity has taken is in a reduction in pollinators. And this has been in the news, both in terms of managed pollinators like honeybees, but also the wild and native uh, pollinators, mostly bees, of which there's some 4,000 species uh, in North America. But for our crops, we don't typically think about pollinators as being a part of that system. As you all know, corn is wind pollinated, uh, and soybeans have been bred for uh, self-fertilization. So we don't really think about these as having a community of pollinators involved uh, in them. However, there's evidence that corn can be a source of pollen. It's maybe not the most nutritious pollen, 
But when it's as, ab as abundant as it is, it gets used by bees. And soybean can be a source of nectar for many pollinators. And many of the beekeepers in the Midwest will refer to their honey as being soy honey. Now, it tastes like clover honey because it gets mixed in there, but a lot of their bees are foraging in these soybean fields. And if you spend time like my student Adam Bernhorst uh, did, you can see this interaction occurring. We've done more work than just go out with cameras. We've gone out with a variety of uh, sampling methods to look at what that community might be. And what we found was kind of shocking to me. In this green desert, we found a community of at least 40 species of wild, solitary bees, including honeybees. And there's some evidence, as we were collecting this data in central Iowa, there was some evidence coming out of Brazil and historically out of the south of the United States that even though soybeans are bred for self-fertilization, that if the issue is forest and you put honeybees next to a field of soybeans or even cage a soybean plant with these bees, you can increase the yield of the soybeans. One other thing to say about that is that we've had this intensification of the landscape in terms of converting perennial over into annual uh, plants. Recently, we've seen an increase in uh, what a colleague at Penn State referred to as uh, the large-scale deployment of seed treatments is driving, uh, driving a rapid increase in the use of neonicotinoid insecticides and preemptive pest management. So in the early 90s, neonicotinoids as a class of insecticide were available commercially, and their use has uh, grown exponentially. As Maggie Douglas and John Tucker report out of Penn State University, in the United States, it's estimated that 90% of the corn grown in the U.S. is treated with a neonicotinoid seed treatment, as shown here, these are the different seed treatments. Uh, they can include other things, but neonicotinoids up to 90% of the corn, and in soybeans, depending upon, upon where you are in the country, 30 to 60% of soy has this, treat, has this insecticide applied to it. It's preemptive because often the pest that it is targeting the grower doesn't know if they're going to need it. So it's a prophylactic uh, approach to pest management. And in some ways, neonicotinoids are a softer, safer alternative to the broad spectrum insecticides that growers would spray over the top of their foliage. But recently, we've seen evidence from a variety of places, and I'll just share this one, um, that neonicotinoids, neonicotinoids may have an impact, a negative impact, on pollinators. This one is most interesting, uh, published in PLOS One, multiple routes of pesticide exposure for honeybees living near agricultural fields. This is kind of an unexpected um, outcome. Farmers are planting these uh, seeds and producing dust, which has the pesticide in it, the insecticide in it. That dust falls along the few plants that are blooming and pollinators, honeybees, collect that dust, take it back to the hive, and honeybee hive losses have been associated with this novel form of exposure. So given that, this exponential growth in, its, in this form of insecticide use and other insecticide uses I can talk about more if there's time, and this intensive agriculture that has converted a diverse landscape of a lot of floral resources into a limited number of floral resources, it's, it's a challenge now to do beekeeping. And to get a sense of how much of a challenge this is, a group of us at Iowa State University started what we call the Bee and Bean Project. I'm working with an honest-to-goodness biologist, Amy Toth and Adam Dozal, and I'm the sort of applied entomologist. And we went out and looked to see just how hard it is for the bees, the honeybees specifically, when we put hives in this landscape. So we brought out little mini apiaries, and apiaries is a collection of honeybee hives. There's four hives on a pallet, and we brought those to about 20-some uh, soybean farms in landscapes that look a lot like this, where, uh, sorry it's a little washed out, but it's kind of typical central Iowa landscape, a lot of corn and soybeans. Okay. What we found was that the, soy, the honeybees are using the, uh, the nectar, foraging, and they're growing, their, their weight is growing, but after soybeans bloom, we start to see their weight decrease. So they're literally eating themselves, their stories of honey, well into a time when there should be growth going on. 
So I get a little bit, how much time? Three minutes? One minute. Okay. No, no, you got two and a half. Oh, two and a half. <laughs> so uh, to kind of wrap this up, this has been uh, a source of concern for beekeepers around the country. This is the Bee Informed Partnership that is uh, in their last survey, complete survey, they showed 60% loss of honeybees in Iowa and other parts of the Corn Belt. Now, there are states like Maine, uh, which don't typically grow in all that corn, so that's not an issue. But one thing they noted that is in line with the data that we've collected, that summer losses, not overwinter losses, but summer losses surpass winter losses, suggesting that that loss of forage is contributing to this difficulty for beekeepers. And I don't have a whole lot of time, uh, but I want to talk about one practice that might help us con ad address uh, uh, multiple issues. Some of the ones that the previous speaker and I think the next speakers are going to talk about. The science-based trials of row crops with prairie strips. Putting prairie into this annual crop system so that there's a barrier to the water that moves down these watersheds where corn and soybeans are grown. And what that looks like when these funnels are placed at the base of those watersheds, this is 100% no-till crop. Quite a bit of sediment loss there. This is prairie. Both the upright stems and the, the, uh, the roots produce uh, in, uh, a habitat that can absorb that moisture and prevent that sediment loss. And just putting 10 per, taking 10% out of production can have a substantial reduction in sediment loss and nutrient loss. And estimates by our colleagues have shown that a 90% reduction in sediment, 90% reduction in nitrate, and I think it's 88% in phosphate. And having this right next to crop fields provides a flowering habitat for bees. And when we go out and we look at bees in that landscape, what we find is that while those plants are providing a floral resource throughout the year, this is survey work of those plants by a group at Michigan State. You can find more data on this at their website, nativeplants.msu. And when we looked at our prairies, in the stripped project, what we found was that prairies are acting as a refuge for these pollinators. So this is the average number of pollinators that we found for habitat, both in prairie and the crop. When it's 100% crop, there's virtually few, if any, of these wild bees there. But right next door, we see those bees there, and with a little bit of spillover. That's about time. That's time. I'm just going to leave up a few uh, po bullet points here. And if you haven't heard enough about strips, consider visiting you, the YouTube site for Strips the Movie. I promise you it's safe for work. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, man. Next up is Craig. So you've just heard from three eminent scientists, and now it's down to me, which is sort of like one of the curves that Rick showed me. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I am not a scientist, although I played one for a while at the National Academy of Sciences before they found out. Um, but I am an advocate, just for full information. I'm an advocate for soil, for water, for sustainable agriculture, and public health. So. Keep that in mind when you're listening to uh, what, what I'm going to talk about. So in terms of thinking about the cost, the true cost of American food, one cost that's often not taken into consideration is, is the taxpayer dollars that are spent trying to minimize the, the externalities that um, these farming systems are creating. And that's actually a cost that we can put good numbers on. And that's what I'm going to touch on today. <clears throat> so you've seen this. Remember the source of nitrogen that, to the Gulf that you saw earlier. This is the US Corn Belt. It, it overlaps almost precisely the earlier map that you saw. Um, I want to point out it, it's, it's it's impossible to overemphasize the intensity of this landscape. If you look at that dark, the darkest red, over 75% of all the land in those counties is planted to corn or soybeans. If you take the next lighter red county, now you're over half of all the land in the county 
is um, planted to corn or soybeans. So, so next time you're flying over this part of the world, get a window seat, hopefully it won't be cloudy, and just look. It's a remarkable landscape. And this is what it looks like. As we were told earlier, you know, for about four months out of the year, this is one of the most productive landscapes on the planet. But for eight months out of the year, this landscape looks like this. Hopefully it's got this nice cover of residue, but far too often it looks more like this. This is why this landscape is so vulnerable. It's it, why it's so vulnerable to losing soil, nitrogen, phosphorus, farm chemicals, is during this period of the year. And, and, and this landscape is becoming more vulnerable because of the increased frequency of extreme storm events. Unfortunately, usually in the spring, before the crop starts emerging and there's more protection on this field. And that's what accounts for a lot of the red blobs you saw on Rick's slides about soil erosion. So this is the challenge that folks like Jim and Seth have, is how do, you, how do, you, how do we manage this, this highly vulnerable landscape in a way that protects soil, protects water, reduces the externalities of this farming system? The good news is there's all kinds of really fabulous conservation practices that, if on the landscape, does a really, really, really good job of protecting that landscape from soil erosion, water pollution, and the public health consequences of that. And those farmers that are using these, you know, their farms are a thing of beauty. Um, unfortunately, they're often an oasis um, surrounded by farms who aren't using these practices. So from a public policy perspective, what we've done is we've spent a lot of money trying to encourage farmers to put these practices in place on their operations. This is just federal conservation dollars through the Department of Agriculture, through the U.S. Farm Bill. These are just the biggest three of those programs. There's a huge acronym list of programs. But so over five years, between 2011 and 2014, we've spent $7.2 billion in the Corn Belt to encourage farmers to use these conservation practices. And the question that's in front of us now in terms of advocacy and policy is why aren't we doing better, right? With this kind of investment, and we've been making these investments for decades, you know, why are actually a lot of these externalities escalating rather than reducing? Well, here's one reason, is we spend $25 billion over that same period on production-enhancing subsidies. These are the commodity subsidies, crop insurance subsidies that are really designed to uh, ensure, to encourage farmers to, to intensify production of corn and soybeans in this landscape. They unfortunately also create really significant perverse incentives that you heard about this morning from John Foley and others, that uh, for two reasons. One is the real beneficiaries of these subsidies are not necessarily farmers, but they're landowners. And as you heard Rick say, well over half of the land that's farmed in Iowa every year is farmed by somebody who doesn't own it, but is simply renting it from a landlord. And it's over time the landlords that are winning this game, not the farm operators. And um, if you think about this in terms of your 401k, if the government guaranteed that your 401k would never fall below 85% of its expected value, I promise you my allocation would be way riskier than it is. So we've created a system where landowners rather than farmers are benefiting, and we've reduced, we've subsidized a lot of risk that leads people to take risky chances that are often not good for the environment. Um, but we're also up against the inherent weaknesses 
of the, this voluntary approach to conservation that we have relied on for decades. And you see those, we've known about these problems. Some of us have spent more time than I care to remember trying to do policy reform to, to, um, to reduce some of these inherent weaknesses, but what we've discussed, and with limited success, frankly. But what we've discovered lately is that the real fatal flaw in this policy approach to reducing externalities associated with these farming systems is that if a farmer can voluntarily install a practice, <clears throat> some other farmer can voluntarily take that practice out. And that's exactly what we've been seeing. Um, this is a, a study we called Fooling Ourselves, where we used aerial imagery and remote sensing to look at two critical conservation practices, stream buffers and grass waterways in eight Iowa watersheds between 2011 and 2014. So <clears throat> there was some good news. We could see you know, a stream buffer appeared sometime between 2011 and 2014 that hadn't been there before. You know, that's, that's a really nice step forward. But if you look somewhere else, often just down the road, you see this. So there's a stream buffer that some other landowner had taken out. Similarly, with grass waterways, which prevent the kind of gully erosion you saw on um, Rick's slides, you know, again, we see places where those grass waterways appear over that four year period, but you know what's coming. We see other places where those grass waterways disappeared over that same period. So on net, what we found was that over this time period, despite the fact that some landowners had installed riparian buffers, more landowners had taken those buffers out. So we actually had a net loss of riparian protective buffers over that period. In the, in the grass waterway side, uh, we did see a gain, net gain, in grass waterways, but the, most of that gain was wiped out by losses on other properties. So, so what are we going to do? Well, I think it's time for standards. I think it's time to, to set, to create a set of basic conservation practices that we expect farmers to put in place and maintain on their operations with or without financial assistance. And I, here's my big four. Here are the four practices that I think should be part of the responsibility of landowners that go hand in hand with the rights of that land ownership. And, and these are practices that I think most farmers, at least farmers that I've talked to, would think are reasonable that they're really not, you know, these kind of activities is really not good business practice, certainly not good for agriculture's brand. All of these have fairly simple solutions that are not, in not terribly expensive, but the point is we can argue about this list, and I wish we would, but, but the point is there has to be a list. We have to set some standards for what we think is acceptable and appropriate management of this landscape. And then on top of that, we need plenty of money and assistance for those farmers that want to go and landowners that want to go way beyond that. And if I could wave a magic wand and redesign the entire US federal policy and state policy, frankly, towards conservation on the agricultural landscape, this is what it would look like to me much less emphasis on money to farmers, much more emphasis on a standard of care, a local entity like a conservation district that has the resources and authority to really make change and, and accountability, a much more robust scientific and technical infrastructure that will help us use state-of-the-art means to ensure these practices are going in the right places and help farmers make those kind of decisions. Just one, um, one last passing thought. If you looked at our existing policy and institutional framework and just looked at how money is invested today, it's the absolute opposite. 
of what I've put on that pyramid. So I think if we're going to continue to invest money in this landscape and expect change, business as usual is not going to do it no matter how much more money we pour into incentives to farmers because it's, we, we need a much more fundamental change in the way we do business. Talked about conservation programs. We need to hear from a farmer's perspective with a little, a short response, and then we'll engage you in a discussion. So, Jim, um, comments on what, what you've heard or what you haven't heard, <laughs> what you'd like to say. Come on. Sure, please do. I'm Jim Murdell. I'm a farmer in southern Minnesota, corn and soybeans. And uh, the curve is really getting low now because I'm just a farmer. But uh, I'll try to uh, uh, do the best I can. And, and uh, a couple questions just for Gene and Richard. Um, is there any evidence that any of the conservation practices uh, that have been implemented over the last 20 or 30 years are making any difference with soil erosion or nutrient pollution. So uh, on the Mississippi River, looking at it from the total land point of view, yep. there's been no decrease in nitrate. There's been a slight increase, you could say, but the groundwater may have gone from the, in the Midwest, the groundwater concentration last year. However, if you consider the conservation had prevented further losses, well, then it might have been higher. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's a possibility. And, uh, but otherwise, there's been no indication that there's a federal program to reach a 30% reduction, maybe 45%, and they are now did not make it the first time, and now they have a target for 50, nine years from now to make 20% of that, one, be one fifth of the way in five, in nine more years. And they only have a plan so far. So from 2005, maybe, or so, so now they sh should have made some progress, and they may not. And they've got only a plan so far to go to make progress over the next nine years, the next goal. So it's a pretty limp, classic uh, record of achievement, in my opinion. How about you? Yeah, so conservation from your erosion standpoint, yes. Uh, 1982, when the National Resources Inventory started, and that is a USDA estimate of soil erosion statewide, uh, the erosional rates were about 8.2 tons per acre per year. They bottomed out in 1997 at about 5.2 tons per acre. So they dropped about 40%. And then when, from that time until now, they've risen to 5.8 tons per acre based on the NRI estimate. Okay. So then no, no, we think that conservation utility, cost compliance required for the, in the farm program of 82? 85. 85. Took a lot of the erosive land and actually a lot of production, the conservation practice you mentioned, and, and reduced utility. You, you talked about that, what you're doing on your farm, it's great. Uh, has had a very positive impact, and what happened to uh, corn prices, to commodity prices, you know, in the mid 2000s? Mm -hmm. You know, they went, we, at that point in time, CRP land went out, and now we see those erosion rates starting to climb. That's why I kind of asked the question is, uh, it, it's kind of for my own, uh, when I started farming, we plowed everything black, and, and, uh, We've done some things to what we call conservation tillage, things like that, but I'm finding that we need to go farther. And you know, eight years ago I did, we're strip tilling and no tilling now, and that's why I asked if there was any, I, I just don't think we're doing enough to, to solve some of these problems uh, with nutrient um, pollution and, and uh, you know, the erosion. And the other thing that Craig mentioned too is the economics of, or the fluctuations in the programs. Let's say the, the CSP program or the, um, you know, the set aside where we put grassland in. When prices were down, farmers jumped on that. 
that, okay, that's a way, I'll do that. But as soon as prices of corn and soybeans went up, and they could, they got out of the program so that, that it's not a perpetual program, it just moves with economics. And, you know, I've only got five minutes here, but it, it's, 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 a, um, it's a problem because I'm, I'm a family farmer, I don't have any other job except farming, so I have to, to uh, provide for my family and keep the farm afloat. And most of the innovation or, uh, or changes I make in the farm are dictated by economics first, and then, um, you know, the, the environment. But as a fourth or fifth generation farm, I mean, it's important to me that there is a value, a big value in my mind to environmental um, protection because I want my farm to be as good as it was or better for my kids and grandkids and the next generation. But it's hard because economics dictate and farm policy, um, food policy, probably has to change a little bit um, for us to, to implement some of the things we need to do. Thank you, Jim. So we're going to uh, engage you in the discussion right now and see what, what's on your mind that you'd like to talk about with our panelists. So if you could all Join us. You don't have to sit. You can stand if you like. It's up to you, Jim. You want to come back up too? And um, um, I put some cards on your on your chair. So if we don't get to your question or comment, just write it down, and I, I promise you I'll collect them, and we'll try and integrate them into some kind of summary that we set. Not quite tonight, but, but we will. So so feel free to do that. So. Um, do you have questions or comments for for any of the panelists? Sure. Um, There's actually a question for Jim and a little bit for Dr. Cruz. Could you state your name? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Greg Richardson, and I uh, am, I guess, associated with. Uh, I'm going back to school in fall for a graduate degree uh, at the uh, University of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested to hear from you, Jim, about. Can you tell me about how economics drives your operation? I think that's true for a lot of people in corn and soy systems. Um, as you move more into conservation till and strip till, um, have you seen a value proposition and how that's affected your soils? And if you think about your economics versus maybe any neighbor's economics that hasn't adopted those practices, how that may actually benefit you now or potentially in the future? And then, actually, I have a separate question, so I'll wait and leave it at that. Yeah, um, like I said, economics for me dictated the change to strip till, no till. Um, in, eight, in, in seven years, we've reduced our fertilizer uh, rates by 30%, maintaining the yields are maybe a little better. It's hard to say for sure with, you know, maybe better genetics and then the weather in those years was good. I'm not sure, but, but we've reduced. Um, you know, the fertilizer, the fuel by 30 to 40 percent. All that means is is my inputs are lower, so I, I put more money in my pockets as I when I sell a bushel of corn. And uh, so, uh, and then also um, our, our organic matter in our soil, we're starting to see a, a rise in that, and that's very positive. And, the till, um, so yeah, it's there's there's um, economic return that comes real fast, and then some that's coming down the road, and it's just it's a it's a process, and you got to stick with it. I think a lot of farmers try it, and then and then um, it doesn't work, or it doesn't work as well as they thought it might, and they give up. On it. But we're kind of out there on our own. I mean, there's nothing, not that we're asking for somebody, all business decisions, whether you're a, you know, CEO of, of Nestle's or you're a farmer in, in the Midwest, 
you have to make a decision uh, on how to run that operation and, and, and you know, it's, it's kind of the same thing. So. Can you just, what, what is, say your, the way you practice it, strip tilling, no tilling, and did you say you reduce fertilizer use or fertilizer cost by 30%? And did you get the same yield? Use and yeah, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't have a, a video or anything of strip till is just basically a, a, a machine. Instead of plowing 100% of the soil, we're, you, we're we're making strips in the field at 30 inch spacings and then planting the crop in those 30 inch zones or strips. So it's a more efficient way to use uh, instead of broadcasting fertilizer over the whole profile of the soil for, for making zones and uh, so over time um, those zones are you know um, it's just a more efficient way of, of doing it. Cotton fertilizer rates 30% less and we're trying to go more than that but I don't want to shoot my foot off and tell you know for sure. The yields stay the same? Yes as far as I can tell like I said it varies um, you know year to year with rainfall and mother nature but it, i'm going to stick with it it's, it's been a good move for me hi i'm erin freeney and i'm connected to two sort of food related nonprofits, leah's pantry in san francisco and the greenhorns i don't know too much about farming but i was wondering from a scientific kind of ecological perspective is it less intensive on the soil in our environment to be doing diversified vegetable cropping, which I feel like from what I've read it is, and then is amongst the mix of like potential programs or conservation efforts that in the Corn Belt we could look at would be trying to convert some land into diversified vegetable farming. Like, is that being discussed as a, a strategy? Is there really a need for all the corn we're producing, which I feel like we don't maybe need at all? Like, is, is that anywhere in the mix, or are people just pretty like, we will continue to grow corn and soy on this property forever? Uh oh, there's a lot of ways to answer that question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, please. Um, so, when you say diversified. Like vegetable production. Um, so, yes. if you're doing that, say, organically, mm -hmm. uh, then. You can, I think there's evidence in the literature that suggests that, yeah, that does have lower impact, especially on biodiversity. Mm -hmm. And organic farms, especially those that are diversified, as you described, have greater biodiversity than, say, a monoculture like a corn and soybean, you know. Um, however, if you drift away from that to vegetable and fruit production uh, that is conventional, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, environmental impacts can be as greater, not greater. Because the amount of pesticide, insecticide, especially, is my world, uh, is is much greater than what goes on in corn and soybeans. Now, historically, over the last what 15 years or so, with the advent of the GMO crops, the fully applied insecticide pesticides have gone down. Right? Um, whereas in some of our fruit and vegetable production, that trend hasn't been the case. We have CSAs, community supported agriculture groups in the Midwest that are expanding. Mm -hmm. Uh, relative to large-scale production, one of the challenges with vegetables is that uh, in California, you shut off the irrigation when it's time to harvest. In Iowa, the Midwest, you can't control mom nature and the rainfall. You can have a, a multi-billion dollar crop out in the field, it's time to harvest, and you get two weeks of rain. So that's a, a, a real challenge. All of Iowa is rain-fed agriculture. The, and in, could I add that? I think you're on the right track when you're thinking about diversification, but I don't think fruits and vegetables. There's, there's really good work that's been done at Iowa State University that lengthening the rotation, you know, like adding a small grain, adding a cover crop, um, can have tremendous environmental benefits. How much? Do you remember the numbers? How much? I can't hear you. How much benefit? Oh, they can reduce um, nitrogen applications by 50, 60 percent, herbicide applications by 80 to 90 percent, um, and maintain the same corn and soybean yields uh, as a more conventional rotation. The problem is where's the market for those new crops that you've just added to the rotation? 
So, you know, we can imagine, kind of go back to what Jim was saying, is, you, you know, there's a bigger context around why decisions get made the way they get made, and, and unless we really consciously change that context, you know, what, what are you going to do with your wheat crop if, you know, if nobody wants it, right? So, so there is a much bigger issue here than just what an individual farmer thinks is going to do. And unless we get after that, we're, we're going to, people are going to make the same decisions. Some people like Jim are, are, have made a decision to manage their farm in a, in a conservation-minded way. Um, because of his values and ethics. Well, there's other folks that aren't making those decisions. And those are the folks I think we need to level the playing field for farmers like Seth and Jim, where they're not competing with people for land and other stuff, the folks that are doing a much worse job. And then just, just one last thing. The other thing, there was a study done at the Leopold Center in um, Iowa about the potential for fruit and vegetable production in that part of the world. The conclusion was that given the growing season, um, you, could, you could meet the entire demand for fruits and vegetables in that region on 100,000 acres, right? But there's 25 million acres planted in Iowa every year. In fact, there's more acres planted to corn in Iowa every year and there are fruits and vegetables in the entire U.S. So local food is great. It's really good for people and better diets and better tasting food, but it's not gonna, it's, it's not gonna deal with this, these large issues. Can, can I just add one thing and then I'll get to your question, but isn't, is it true that animals on the land, if they were out of confinement, would be as, uh, eat some of that more diverse set of products. But as long as we have animals in confinement, we're more likely to feed them more in soybeans and alfalfa. Kind of almost secure. Yeah, lots more well managed pasture would be a huge advantage. Well, it also gives us a value added component. Right now, we're mass producing in an industrial way. At, at the product that we sell wholesale, but we pay, but we pay retail for the inputs. Uh, the lack of diversity, especially the animal component, would be a value added. So my question is about um, land ownership and land use. Um, and there is always a lot of policy discussion about subsidies, but it seems to me there's very little discussion about who owns that land and who owns it um, determines, for example, if you're gonna have cattle, it's a long-term investment to have cattle. And then um, if you're only renting the land, you're probably not gonna do that long-term investment. And as long as, I mean, they're all interrelated, so as long as you have the subsidies, if you're a renting farmer, it's entirely logical to grow soybeans and corn because you can find a market for it. So, so that's the one we uh, looked at probably about 40 or 50 percent of the wa whole watershed. We found there's a really direct relationship between subsidies and crop use. Mm -hmm. And those subsidies are, were, uh, and probably carried over by a legacy to a few crops and favored crops among them. So corn was at the top of the heap. Mm -hmm. So if you took the same amount of money and subsidized other things uh, to fit the more regional pattern and other needs, instead of having rather favored ones, uh, then it would be better to have the subsidy directed broadly. So for example, the subsidies are usually a small percentage of the gross cost, but they're a high percentage of the net. So if you don't have the subsidies in Iowa, sometimes people would say they, their profit was in the mailbox because that's where they got the check from. 
So I don't think it's quite true everywhere, but I mean, people got a lot of, it really drove choices of land use by their cropping choices, which means it drove water use, nitrogen use, pesticide, whether it was homogenous or, you know, heterogeneous setting. It was, it's really a good policy instrument if you choose to use it. And it has, and in another way, I mean. But it seems to me that who owns the land is the most important question to look at because if the farmers are not the owners, then we have a really hard time having what Craig talked about is a long-term investment in policies that um, benefit the land, the environment, and the people on the land. But we don't talk about land reform in the U.S. Yeah, we might need to, I mean, in a in a perfect world, I'd like to see uh, only farmers own the land because they have a vested interest in, in, in the soil. But, you know, that's not going to happen. But uh, um, probably if there's subsidies or thing enhancements or whatever for conservation, I'll have to maybe target it to the owner rather or share with the operator. Eventually, it'll come to the operator. I mean, if, if there's... Uh, tax break or something like that for implementing conservation practices on your land that you don't want. Twenty one percent of Iowa sorry. Twenty one percent of Iowa is owned by people that live outside the state. Twenty one percent. Twenty one percent. Well it doesn't take my but just the land I farm now in nineteen fifty five there was eleven families. I do it all my I, I farm those eleven farms and Lisa and I, two, two people plus uh, two people in the fall, do what 11 families used to do not too many years ago. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of land that's still owned by relatives of those families mm -hmm. um, that are displaced or not not in the community anymore. And so I was just going to say that the technology that helps you do that is owned by distant corporations. Right. I think that I don't think we can under overemphasize that point because you can't really do conservation on rented land unless the landowner is also conservation land. Right? I mean it, it's probably in my career the thing that scrambled our traditional approach to conservation more than any other thing because you know, Jim isn't the ultimate decision maker, right? There's all these other decision makers in the mix now. What are, what are their motivations? So that's why, I mean, that's the biggest reason I'm advocating for this, these basic standards. Mm -hmm. It's the only way I can think of to really get the land over, the land more in the day. So, so some of my colleagues who work very closely <laughs> with farmers through extension, uh, or I should say through Ag, through Extension, talk about a need to come up with two recommendations, one for the farmer who's actually doing the farming, and then one for the landowner, whether they're in the state or out of the state. And uh, one area that's a little bit different from what we've been talking about with regards to soil and some water conservation is um, issues related to pest management that affect the value of the land. And this is starting to come out in discussions we've had uh, at Iowa State with uh, and business with uh, farmers and landowners, when we talk about how overuse of pesticides that leads to resistance can have site-specific consequences that make it harder for those farmers to, and, and the landowner then, to rent that farm for people to farm. So as we develop uh, BT resistant populations of rootworm, whether it's for that landowner or that renter, that's going to be a legacy that goes on. And so one of the, the topics that's been coming up beyond coming up with like a standard of care is uh, convincing that landowner that it's in their best interest to adopt more conservation or progressive farming practices. And so there's now an effort that I'm hearing in our campus of, well, we've got to, come, again, come up with two educational programs, one for the farmer, but then another for the landowner so that they see that sort of long-term consequences of not being engaged in our discussions on conservation. I'll just say real quickly, uh, my organization also works, engages women landowners in one of the areas that we work with, who 
and recreational land uses. It's two different sets of, so the, 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 the non, the landowners is a diverse set of people. Um, sometimes people living way far away, whose parents made a farm one time, but no. So, so we try and do that and have those conversations about what do you want for your land? How can you write conservation into your leases? Uh, but I'll move on. You, you have another question, then I'll come in. You have another question, so I'll come in. Yeah, yeah uh, Peter Lander now with Bird Justice. Uh, question, I know Craig, you've written about crop insurance as one of the subsidy programs. You mentioned a few other ones. Are there, uh, are there plaus politically plausible ways to change uh, uh, or mess with the crop insurance program to create incentives for some of the, the your four best practices or other good practices? Is that a program that might offer more opportunity for change than some others? Well, I, I wish you wouldn't have asked the phrase politically plausible. One of us would have to be different. Very encouraging answers for you. <laughs> so far, um, so far, the politics have not been possible, but they're getting more possible if, um, because for for the following reason, the, uh, and now I'm really talking like an advocate, right? The, um, one of our fundamental problems with reforming farm policy is that farm policy reform is largely <coughs> in the agriculture. And as my boss on the Senate Ag Committee told me on my first day in the job, nobody joins the Senate Agriculture Committee to burnish their environmental record. Right? The, the folks that self-select on those committees are there for very different reasons than that. But um, it, it, the, the, it, the amount of interest in these issues is growing in Congress in members that are not on the agriculture. And that's where the politically plausible change will come. Now, there's a million different ways that with parliamentary procedure that those folks can be denied the ability to amend legislation and so on and so forth, but the pressure is building and the cost of these programs is also escalating. So there's, you know, it's getting easier and easier for us as an advocacy organization to interest folks in some meaningful subsidy reform. And some of those calls are coming from agriculture themselves, from farmers who feel like this isn't working for them anymore. Can, can I just ask the same question for it's Jim? Yeah. Uh, how does, what do you, what's your view of the crop insurance program? Um, I, I think the, you know, the subsidy program is probably, the crop insurance, I don't, the only problem I see with that is if I wanted to grow fruits or vegetables on my farm, that's pretty restricted, I can't do that because I have a corn soybean and then I lose, I, I mean the, the crop insurance is, 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 they're privately insured but publicly subsidized and, and, um, I don't know how it happened, but it's very difficult to, you know, to to have one part of your farm uh, vegetables and the other part corn soybeans. But getting back to the the uh, the farm subsidy, that is that is broken. I mean, we don't have a safety net. If we have, we do have a safety net, but it's laying right on the concrete floor, <laughs> so it really doesn't give us a whole lot of good. And it's spending so people are. Taxpayers are spending a lot of money for that. Um, we, I don't know exactly how to do it. That's one of the reasons I'm here, because I want to try to figure it out myself. But the farm program is busted, and it's a bad, it's a bad thing. Um, that's going to be hard to. You, you're talking, John. You're, you you talked about that too. The the farmers really the beneficiary of a lot of those subsidies. It's, you know, Cargill, John Deere, these, and I'm not anti-business or corporation either, because those guys, I work with them, but yeah, they, they benefit from the subsidies. 
and, and the landlords, the more money we see on the landowners. If I rent, I rent 50% of what I farm, and the land, uh, if the government would, let's just hypothetically say I get $50 an acre as a subsidy, the landlord's going to want at least $25, maybe $30. Of so, I mean, it's, it's the way it works, and it shouldn't be like that. It's become incredibly inequitable if you look at the distribution of those subsidies, something like 10% of the eligible entities, and they actually are entities. They're mostly not farmers, they're general partnerships, they're just operations. And, um, they may be farming in eight or nine states. Um, you know, they, they get upwards of 60% of the entire flow of subsidies. So, it's just, it is really become broken. So, is this a good time to make a policy shift? Given that it's, it's not, not, well, I mean, it's, you have, a, you have a weak market and you have some structural problems, and you have people complaining. So, it's not like everything's hunky dory and don't rock the boat. It'd be a time to make a change that maybe could be better. Of course, it might be worse, but. And we could do that, as the speaker said this morning, by all working together, because we can't get it done from within agriculture itself. I think it's that within political, within political I think, agriculture. I think yeah. if farmers were actually in charge, we'd be in a better place. But we need, to, I think that's what, why is a corn and soybean farmer have a convention like this? I mean, it's almost like suicide, because I, I'm, I, <laughs> I grow GMO crops and I'm, I, I spray glyphosate, Roundup Ready. That's, but that's what I almost, I feel like I almost have to from a, again, an, an economic, looking at a go economic, I don't have a choice. I'm kind of keyhole into that. And I want to, I'd like to have more rotation in my, more change crops, or anything, but very difficult. <laughs> on, on, on that uh, crop insurance, do you know who the biggest lobbyist was for the current farm program associated with crop insurance? Who spent the most money? What what entity? Monsanto. Any ideas? Yeah. You say Goldman Sachs. <laughs> Monsanto. No. No. This is a good answer for a different question. <laughs> Cardinal. Uh, yeah, yeah, Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo. Because oh, the insurance component. And the, and the insurance companies are one of the few, this is one of the few sectors where they get their administrative costs covered by public subsidies. Not, that's separate from the subsidy for the insurance costs to the farmers. They get their, their internal administrative costs covered. No other sector has that. So it's an incredibly sweet deal for the crop insurance industry. We worked with an economist at Iowa State University who estimated that for every dollar that ends up in a farmer's hands who has a claim against the, the crop insurance policy, another dollar goes to the crop insurance policy. Oh. So you can <laughs> save a lot of money just by changing that equation. So if, if I can, how can that be actuarially sound, which is what it is required to be? Yes. So, so it is actuarially sound. The RMA does set an actuarially sound premium. But then the Congress tells RNA how much of that premium the taxpayer is going to pay. So it's that it's the way these subsidies are set up, and it's the way gains and losses are shared between the federal government and the crop insurance industry where things start, where things start to go wrong, and you end up with these bizarre consequences. So we're just about time. I'm sure if the speakers are willing and you want to engage, we can keep going. I don't mean to chase you out, but I just want to note that it's getting about time. I know you had another question, and I just didn't know there any other questions that people have that want to get asked. Yes. So, how about, I'll go to your second question, I'll go right back to you. More close to the okay. um, So, I've been hearing a lot about the efforts around the field to market program, and I'm just curious whether anyone has an opinion on whether that is starting to set, you know, a step towards, um, you know, conservation methods in farming and more recently. I gave a talk, three talks to ADM. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, now this is not field of market, this is the Unilever model for their 10, 10, 10 cents per bushel of soybean increase for their, their sustainable mayonnaise product. Okay, if you move your needle just a little bit, do just a little bit more for conservation. Okay, the reason I mentioned the three talks, uh, ADM furnished a meal, each one of these places, and a free cash bar, another, one of the three. You know how many farmers showed up totally? <laughs> it's, it's a sustainability mm -hmm. workshop. 30 total. If it had been about fertilizer use, you'd quadruple those numbers. So yeah, there is some effort in there, and there, you, this group was using the field to market calculator as their means of determining whether or not they were eligible for the dime. But uh, it's, it's not a dig on the farmers, it's just that, like, like Jim says, when you're, you're trying to pay for shoes and your kid's schooling, <coughs> the money comes first. I think, I, think the, I think what we've seen is a more direct link between the consumer and the farmer or the production. The more those sort of industrial standards or, or consumer facing standards are working, just, just look at the impact on the animal agriculture, right? I mean, the cage free mm -hmm. cans. And, I mean, it seems like every week there's someone coming in announcing they're not going to use or buy meat treated with antibiotics, or, you know, they're not going to buy pigs that are, you know, in gestation so, so I think with feel the market, you know, how, how do you take that to form a soybeans? Right? It's just it's it's just a long chain between you know Jim's farm and McDonald's. A rock, yeah, we're talking about a raw commodity and the system with processing and everything. And I don't consider. You know, the person in the grocery store pushing the cart my customer. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just I'm too far removed from that. Mm -hmm. um, but, and it's hard for me, I mean, it's hard for me to trademark my corn or my soybean because it's kind of a, it's a basic mm -hmm. commodity that's traded all over the world. So Jim, if you had a chance to move to a more diverse rotation, what would help you, you know, do that? What do you think would be the most helpful to you to help make that happen? Um, well, I think, I think the uh, um, companies like the car deals, the, the grain companies, if they want, I'll produce anything that anybody wants that I can on my farm, but I need to get paid for it. That's, that's pretty simple, but, but uh, in our area, like I said, I can't even grow wheat because I'd have to haul it 150 miles away to sell it, and that's just logistically pretty hard to do. We're just geared, everything is geared, and that's my, my greatest concern as a, a grandfather now, uh, and my, I don't know if my, my daughter's farming, but if my grandson's going to farm, I don't know, but my greatest concern is where I'm, I've got no flexibility, I mean, and, and uh, corn and soybeans become a product that nobody wants to buy anymore, I'm going to be in trouble, so I'm going to make start getting the ship turning in the right direction before it's too late. And I don't, that's why I'm here. Thank you. Well, I think we heard some practical options today, like Strips Project. We no longer rotation for work. If, if, I mean, if there's a market for the products. Um, we know that we need changes in the farm bill that affects landowners as well as operators. And we have standards of care maybe as one way of that. Um, we're getting better at measuring how much is coming off, which is more than we thought. <laughs> and it's not decreasing. So we know change is needed. And, and clearly with the politics of this, being from an ag state ourselves, Minnesota, so we have a ranking member on this House Agriculture Committees in our district. So we need to listen on some things and disagree on most. <laughs> But, but we're, it's going to take, take uh, all of us working together to get that change. Um,
Can I ask a quick question, George? Yeah. Uh, and this is uh, to Craig. How much, on average, are we paying crop insurance subsidies per acre? Well, Just a rough acre, number. Um, that varies dramatically from county to county and crop to crop in the region of the country. But overall, the federal government pays about two thirds of the premium of a crop insurance policy. But that, you know, there's a lot of variation depending on the coverage level. So that, that would be about $40, 35 40 per it's acre? About $30 an acre, usually, $28 an acre for that the farmer ends up paying mm -hmm. for the policy, and then you know, somebody who actually is a scientist would calculate what sure. the actual premium is. Well, the re reason I was asking that, if that $40 per acre estimate that, that I put up there is, is reasonably close, you add another $30 per acre, then we're, we're picking up about 70 dollars per acre for the current system. I mean, and there are other costs so but I mean, that's... And that's to protect how much you know, crop value? Well, that's protect crop value, and that's the off-site cost, that's a loss in production value, that's all the other. How much would that be? Is that 1% or 10% of it? Of the, of the total crop value? Yeah. Uh, at three dollar per bushel corn, that's probably about uh, 30%. 40% of the total crop value. Yeah. So this is uh, directed to you, Dr. Cruz, but all over the country, but you were talking about the costs associated with soil erosion, and that it was actually a higher cost to pursue conservation in many cases than it was to actually conserve the soil. Uh, my understanding of what you presented was that that was looking at sort of a nutrient uh, the correlation to the nutrient value in that soil? Nutrient and crop loss, crop yield loss okay. in subsequent years. And I was wondering if, <coughs> if you've seen studies or if you've thought about adding uh, adding the value of lost soil, uh, or I'm sorry, water holding capacity or um, protection against pests and diseases and other things that having higher levels of topsoil, topsoil uh, that is embedded within those estimates because uh, those estimates are coming from changing topsoil. Those curves I showed yield as a function of topsoil depth. Mm -hmm. So by changing topsoil depth, you are changing those parameters. They're embedded within. You lose organic matter, you lose water holding capacity, you lose nutrients, and that crop loss reduction is the net effect of, of all those accumulated. Thank you.